Welcome to the third video in the series. We're building a PiDP11. This is a scaled replica of the Digital Equipment Corporation's seminal mini computer, the PDP11. In part one, we prepared the Raspberry Pi, which drives the replica. In part two, we soldered up the dozens or so of fiddly passive components, and this time we'll be finishing up the soldering ready for final assembly. We're going a little out of sequence from Oscar's build instructions. I want to finish up the rest of the soldering first. Quick reminder, soldering involves molten metal, hot irons, and noxious vapors. A kit like this assumes that you have some basic skill assembling electronics. If in doubt, I've included some links to safety best practices in the description. Do not try any of this at home unless you understand the risks and you've had a bit of practice. We have a lot of switches to get soldered. They're all in one bag. I'm going to snip that bag open and sort everything out before I get going. There are actually five different types of switches. You get red and purple regular switches, and then you get red and purple momentary or push and hold switches. Last, you get a single white momentary switch. I'm putting them all in different piles. Oscar's directions warn that the terminals on these switches may have tarnished. That was certainly the case on a lot of mine, so I went through each of them with a piece of Scotch-Brite, just to knock off any corrosion. You could use emery paper or contact cleaner and achieve the same thing. All we want here is a clean surface to solder. We start mounting the switches by placing one in the guide at each end. You do this by first putting the larger of the guides down over the switch pads. Use a regular purple switch. Check that the switch goes up. Then try placing it through the first full hole in the guide and through the mounting holes in the board. You may have to tweak the pins a bit. Then, on the left, use the last complete hole, take a regular purple switch from the pile, and check which way it operates. This one must switch down rather than up, so pop that one into place. To mount the rest of the switches, follow the guide on the silk screen. It tells you which switches go where. The first set should all be positioned to flip up. They're in alternating color groups. The other ones toward the right are control switches. They're a mix of static and momentary, up and down. Once we have all the slots and the open end positions populated, it's time to use the second guide template. This one goes over the tips of the switches to align them. Once it's in place on top, you snug the bottom guide back up as far as it'll go. Be careful not to dislodge the switches. To hold this all together as a sandwich, reach for some of those cable ties. You may have to chain them together. The idea is to loop under the bottom guide between one set of switches and over the top guide between the next pair. Then you cinch that down as tight as you can reasonably make them. You should do this in the middle and then one on either side. Exactly how I didn't do it. Next, you need to look at how level the switch bases are. The amount of plastic around the pin bases will affect how evenly they all sit. You may need to press some in a little harder or perhaps trim a little plastic off. I didn't go too mad on this, and once I turn this lot over, they're likely to slip. Now what I should have done is to tape the whole assembly down with masking tape, and that would have provided a consistent tension across the assembly. I'd call that a nice to have, since I'm perfectly satisfied with the result I got. So, turn the board over with the switches down, and now let's start soldering. The approach is to apply heat directly to the terminals for as little time as possible. Oscar warns about overheating them. He recommended getting the pads good and hot with the iron before moving in on the terminals. You should tack in one terminal per switch, then cycle back to the beginning and do the next. I ended up trying about three different approaches until I was happy. Remember, this isn't my day job. In other words, I'm pretty crap. The first couple of attempts are dire. Using just a few seconds of contact, all I'm getting is bone dry joints. My second approach was to help things along with a bit of supplemental flux. Mm, still not good. Then I gave in and I cranked up the iron. I often run 375 or 400 degrees, and for this, I only boosted it up to 320, but that helped a lot. Then I could concentrate on the actual technique. We're going to need to use a relatively large amount of solder on these pins, so I tended to load the iron up first, heat the pad, and then move to the terminal and feed as much solder as I could. Since the iron is on one side of the pin, it's basically ready when the solder flows the whole way back around the pin. Because I'm pretty poor at this, I made a lot of touch ups anyway. But this is the basic approach that got me through. If you get through all that, you can put the iron away. Take out the side cutters and remove those ties. Pull off the top guide, you don't need it anymore. That's it for part three of the series. Part four should follow shortly. 
more vintage technology videos pop up regularly on Beja Vision, so as always, like and subscribe. See you in part four.